welcome to the Gathering of Men. This is our second in a three-week series, uh, and I'm glad you're with us. Hope you checked it out last week. If you haven't, you might want to go back and watch that. A very critical uh, message that uh, we uh, thought through last week. So we're going to talk about uh, the message title today, by the way, is No Greater Deal. No better deal ever. Um, my son and I, Luke, years ago, were in another city, a large city in the country, and we were walking. He was probably, I don't know, eight or nine years old. We were walking down the street in town and all these booths selling uh, luggage and watches and trinkets and everything you can imagine. And Luke was attracted to this big board and table of watches. So he goes over, he checks them out, comes to me, he said, Dad, this is the one I got to have. So how much does it cost? He said, Dad, $5. It's a deal. So I'm kind of smiling inside. He said, I got to have it, Dad. This is great. So he purchases the watch. Uh, actually, I purchased the watch. He puts it on. I mean, that's, that thing was so big on that little arm. Two or three hours later, we're back in our room, and he takes it off, and I heard him, I heard him yell. I said, what's wrong? He said, my watch just fell apart. I mean, the crystal fell out. The hands fell off. I mean, it was a nightmare. And so, again, was that a deal or no deal? Well, let me tell you, I got a deal for you today. This is the best deal that you'll ever be able to be a part of in your lifetime. In Ephesians chapter number two, it tells us about that deal. In Ephesians two in the Bible, uh, verse number eight, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. It is the gift of God. And so this gift of Jesus Christ coming into a person's life and all the benefits that come with that, and we'll look at a few of those today, it's a gift. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. You, will, you and I will never deserve it. It's a gift. It's out of his, the Bible says, his grace. His grace. What is grace? To me, grace is getting something I need, but I don't deserve it. I don't deserve his grace. I don't deserve what he's done for me. I don't deserve all the benefits that he bestows on me if I follow him. Listen, it's a free gift. It's a free gift and a free gift to you and to me. But it wasn't a free gift to him. He paid the ultimate price by dying on a cross so that you and I, might receive this gift. And so, as we look at this today, uh, all I've got to tell you is from the very beginning, i got some good news for you. You know, we're living in a day and a time where the news is not real good. In fact, it's wearing me out at night to watch the news. Sometimes I watch one, two, three straight uh, news programs, and when I'm finished, I feel like I've been through a whooping. Uh, I, maybe you feel that way too. So, the Apostle Paul we're going to look at for a few minutes here and a verse of scripture that he wrote. And Paul had been persecuting Christians. On the road to Damascus, Acts 9, if you haven't read it, go read that, Acts chapter 9, Jesus appears to them. And he's blinded. And eventually, he, through that encounter with Christ, begins to become a follower of Jesus. Following Jesus is not always easy. Listen to what it says in 2 Corinthians 11, 23-27. Paul says, I've served more prison sentences. I've been beaten times without number. I've faced death again and again. I've been beaten the regulation 39 stripes by the Jews five times. I've been beaten with rods three times. I've been stoned once. I've been shipwrecked three times. I have been 24 hours on the open sea. Hmm. In my travels, I have been in constant danger from rivers and floods, from bandits, from my own countrymen and from pagans. I've faced danger in city streets and danger in the desert, danger on high seas, danger among false Christians. I have known exhaustion, pain, long vigils, hunger and thirst, doing without meals, cold and lack of clothing. And so the Apostle Paul, even after having gone through all of that, makes this statement in Romans chapter number 1, verse number 16. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, 
For it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. So he says, I'm not ashamed. Who did he speak this to? He spoke this to the intellectual elite in Rome. And he was saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel as an intellectual system. The gospel has credibility. He wasn't disappointed in Jesus. He wasn't disappointed in the gospel. A number of years ago, I introduced one of the greatest athletes that has ever played uh, sports on this planet. And I introduced him to an audience of parents in a library uh, here in Dallas. Uh, after I introduced him, he gets up and tells this crude joke to the parents. By the way, nobody laughed. And I had watched this guy play. I had tried to emulate how he played. Uh, he was my, one of my sports heroes. And yet when I met him face to face, I was so disappointed. What Paul is saying was, when I met Jesus, I wasn't disappointed. I am not ashamed of Jesus. I am not ashamed of the gospel. He had met Jesus face to face and wasn't disappointed. He tested the gospel. It worked. It stood the test. He experienced the reality of the power of the gospel. It changed his life, and it met his needs. It's very interesting. We're going to talk about needs today. It's very interesting how, in our day and time, people will go uh, to anyone, or everyone, to anything, everything, to get their needs met. In fact, there was a study done a number of years ago called the Hands Eisnick study. And it said, if you go to a psychoanalyst for a year of treatment, at the end of the year of treatment, you have a 44% chance of returning to some degree of health. If you go to a psychologist for a year of treatment, you have a 53% chance of returning to some degree of health. If you go to a psychiatrist for a year of treatment, you have a 61% chance of getting healthy. If you go to nobody, you have a 73% chance of getting well. Well, I'm, I'm all for good counseling, but um, I'm, I'm really big on biblical counseling. These are counselors that know the scripture and uh, they just can't quote verses to you, but they take the wisdom that comes only from the Lord and only from the scripture and apply it to everyday life. So I'm all for counseling. Uh, a number of years ago, I remember this uh, restaurant in Atlanta, Georgia, and it was called Aunt Fanny's Cabin. And so if you were there to eat, a uh, young uh, waiter or waitress would come up and they would have a board around their neck with a menu on it. And so you would uh, read the board as they walked around and then you would place your order. And then the waiter or waitress would say this, if you go away hungry, it's your own fault. And I would say this to you. If you go away hungry from Jesus Christ, then it's your own fault. And I've had a thought as I was thinking through this for today. Some of us don't get close enough to him to let him meet our needs. We know him at a distance. We know him from afar, but we don't know him intimately and up close. And so needs. What kind of needs are we talking about? Well, there are all kinds of needs. Physical, mental, social, emotional, spiritual, needs for freedom from guilt, security, recognition, new experience, love. And it's amazing, again, often we, we try all the wrong things to meet those deepest needs instead of going to Jesus, the very person that made us, who knows how we tick, that knows how we operate, who can meet our needs like no one else can meet our needs. So it's probably not a smart move to move away from him. Now, before I get into this for a few moments today, let me just say this. So often, when people have come to know Christ, they've only been told what Jesus has done for them by dying on the cross, being raised from the dead, accept Jesus, and everything's going to be great. Now, they may not say everything's going to be great, but it's implied. Um, and then the person comes to know Christ and the wheels fall off in their life. So 
before I dig in here, let me just say this. Following Jesus is not a bed of roses. It's not for the faint hearted. The scripture says, for example, deny yourself, Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. To me, in all my years of following Jesus, number one, it's an adventure. It's thrilling to follow Jesus. But on the other hand, it is filled with pain, loss, discomfort, difficulty, and on the lawn, the list can go. So, what kind of needs do we want to talk about today, the, the, the deeper needs that Jesus can meet? First of all, Jesus can meet your need, can meet my need for forgiveness. The great Carl Minniger from the Minniger Clinic in Topeka, Kansas, years ago said that over 60% of the people in mental hospitals today could be released if they could experience a forgiveness of their sin and a relief of their guilt and their shame. So we've got a problem. We've got a problem that only Jesus Christ can, can solve. Only him. And that problem is a deep disease. And the deep disease is called sin. S-I-N. You say, I don't like that word. I don't like it either. And he doesn't like it. But let me tell you what it is. It's an active or passive rebellion against God. It's uh, missing the mark or what God expects of us. It's what I call a spiritual cancer. There's something inside you and me that causes you and me to want to do what you and me want to do. It's, a, it's deeply ingrained in every one of us. And so one of my uh, favorite writers said this years ago, in human nature and experience, there is a basic inner conflict. There's something broken that cannot be fixed, something wrong that cannot be corrected by all the success, effort, money, pleasure, power, or ability in the world. This, there is a basic fear, an aching pain and frustration in life that cannot be covered up forever by smiles and outward trappings of success. Sin. Sin, well, someone said this. Sin, it takes you further than you want to go and keeps you longer than you want to stay. You ever experienced that one? And so what's the product of this sin in our lives? It affects everything. It affects your relationship with God. The Bible says we're cut off from God because of our sin. He's a holy God. I'm not a holy person. It cuts us off from ourselves. There's no way that we can understand our value and our worth because of sin in our lives. It cuts us off from other people because if you're cut off from God, if you're cut off from yourself, how in the world do we think we're going to be able to productively and appropriately relate to other people? So what's God's provision to meet that need? Listen, Jesus Christ was perfect and lived a perfect life while he was on this planet for 33 years. He died on the cross to take on himself, this was God's plan, to take on himself the penalty that you and I were due as a result of our sin. Number three, forgiveness is available to you and me. And so you don't want to walk away from that. And so when Jesus Christ forgives you and forgives me when you ask him to come live in your life. How deep is that forgiveness? How deep is it? Is it just uh, superficial, surfacy? How deep is it? It's complete. The Bible says in Psalm 103, as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our sin from us. And it says in the book of Hebrews, and he remembers it no more. What does that mean? Once you're forgiven, he won't bring it up again. He won't dangle it in your face. He won't say, well, look what I've done for you. Don't you see how bad you were? It's gone. It's completely gone. The past, the present, and the future. Someone said, uh, man, you don't know my sin and my failure. In fact, I've always had the, the fear. In fact, I think I might have had this dream one time of standing before the Lord and and he says to Peter, he says, where's the, where's the book on Tulsa? And Peter looks at him and says, Lord, it's not a book. It's a library. Well, maybe you feel that way. Sometimes I feel that way. I've got so much stuff that he has taken care of when he's come into my life and forgiven me. You know, it's like the, when I was little, I had these little, this little thing called a clean, a slate. And 
you would write on it with a wooden pen or pencil, and then you could lift the sheet, it would clear up, and then you could start writing again and clear up. But after a while, there would be an indent in that on that sheet, and you could tell what had been written. Listen, when Jesus Christ comes into your life, he takes the slate and throws it away. Clean, fresh, as, as, as freshly fallen snow. You're clean. Jesus throws the slate away. Now let me tell you how deep this is, and I hope you'll never forget what I'm getting ready to read you. This man named Michael Coist, years ago, uh, he had uh, some deep things going on in his life, some very uh, deep things. So he prays to the Lord and pours out his heart, and then the Lord responds back to him. So listen. He says, I've fallen, Lord, once more, and I can't go on. I'll never succeed. I'm ashamed. I don't dare look at you, and yet I struggle, Lord, for I know you are right near me, bending over me, watching me. But temptation blew like a hurricane. Instead of looking at you, I turned my head away. Fatal flaw. I stepped aside while you stood silent and sorrowful, like the spurned fiancé who sees his loved one carried away by the enemy, when the wind died down as suddenly as it had arisen. When the lightning ceased after proudly streaking the darkness, all of a sudden I found myself alone, ashamed, disgusted with my sin in my hands. This sin, Lord, that I selected the way a customer makes his purchase. This sin that I paid for and cannot return for the storekeeper is no longer there. This tasteless sin, this odorless sin, this sin that sickens me that I've wanted but want no more that I've imagined and sought and played with and fondled for a long time, that I finally embraced while turning coldly away from you. My arms outstretched, my eyes and heart irresistibly drawn. This sin that I grasped and consumed with gluttony, it's mine now. But it possesses me as a spider web grasps the gnat. It's mine. It sticks to me. It flows in my veins. It fills my heart. It slipped in everywhere. And just as darkness slips into the forest at dusk and fills all the patches with light, I can't get rid of it. I run from it the way one runs from a stray dog. But it catches up with me and bounces joyfully against my legs. Everyone must notice. I'm so ashamed that I feel like crawling to avoid being seen. I'm ashamed of being seen by my friends. But most of all, Lord, I'm ashamed of being seen by you. For you love me, and I forgot you. I forgot you because I was thinking only of myself. And one can't think of two persons at one time. One must choose, and I chose. And Lord, your voice and your look and your love hurt me. They weigh me down. They weigh me down more than my sin. Lord, don't look at me like that. For I'm naked, I'm dirty, I'm shattered with no strength left. I dare make no more promises. I can only lie bowed before you. So he poured out his heart. But then the Lord, the gracious Lord, spoke back to him. Come, child, look up. Isn't it mainly your vanity that's wounded? If you loved me, you would grieve, but you would trust me. Do you think there's a limit to how much I love you? Do you think that for a moment I stopped loving you, but you still only rely on yourself? Child, you must rely only on me. Ask my pardon. Get up quickly. For you see, it's not falling in the mud that's the worst, but it's staying there. So are you in the mud? Go to Christ. He's the only one that will forgive you, relieve you of your, of your sin and of your guilt and of your shame. He can do it. He wants to do it. He's willing and ready to do that. Let me tell you something. If you ever experience the forgiveness of Jesus Christ for real, you will never be the same again. Never. Well, not only does Jesus meet our need for forgiveness, but he also meets our need for significance. So why do we struggle with being okay with ourselves, with understanding our value and our worth. Well, 
Let me give you a couple things. Number one, I think because of the lack of appropriate love and touching when we were young. Uh, I think number two, sin and guilt. This is what uh, David in the Old Testament, the great David said, O oh Lord, have mercy on me in my anguish. My eyes are red from weeping. My health is broken from sorrow. I'm pining away with grief. My years are shortened, drained away because of sadness. Did you hear that? Drained away because of sadness. My sins have sapped, he says, my strength. So the second thing is sin and guilt. It'll do a number on you. And I think in 2020, uh, the time we're living in now, uh, the number of kids in our country and adults, but kids who are committing suicide, it just breaks your heart. I believe the two biggest reasons anybody uh, takes their life, number one, primarily, there are other reasons, but primarily two things, guilt and shame. And by the way, I think guilt and shame, if it's not dealt with and carried around in a person, can lead to depression. So number one is guilt and shame. Number two is not understanding our value and our worth. And we're living in a world every day, especially where I live uh, here in, in Texas, uh, where the society's influence is so strong in terms of trying to measure up to its standard. The society says you got to have brains, beauty, and things, or stuff. That's what kids see. For adults, it's the same thing, but different words, status, appearance, and performance. And so again, it's, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog deal. Listen. A person's self-concept is determined by what you think, what they think about the most important person and what they think in their life. If you draw a triangle, at the top of the triangle, put a question mark. This is what we're saying. A person's self-concept, if you're down at the base of the triangle, a person's self-concept will be determined by what you think the most important person in your life thinks about you. And let me just tell you right now, there is no human being on the planet that can highly esteem you 100% of the time. It is absolutely impossible. For so many years, for so many years, I was so worried about what people thought about me. When a few years ago, all of a sudden it dawned on me that all these people that I was so worried about what they thought about me, they weren't even thinking about me. They could give a rat's ear about me. They remember that. So the key is then, what does Jesus think about me? The only person that you can put at the apex of that triangle that will highly esteem you and never change what they think about you is Jesus Christ. So what does he think about you? Number one, he said, you got to remember, I made you. You're made in my image. You're my masterpiece. And I made a note about this for this today. I hadn't planned on saying this, but people that don't follow Jesus are made in God's image too. And so anyone made in his image, we need to respect them as people made in his image. And so we've got these riots going on all over the country. Let me tell you, the people creating the riots and the people backing the riots do not love themselves. Because if you love yourself and realize and understand you've been made in the image of God, you realize there is a responsibility to respect other people. You don't put them down. You don't yell ugly, obscene things to them. You don't destroy their property. We are living in and watching the scene every night around our country of a bunch of people that don't know how much God loves them. They don't know what he's done for them. They don't understand that their value and their worth comes through the fact that he made them and loves them. This, let me tell you something. You, listen, you will never love somebody else beyond the degree that you love yourself. And you'll never love yourself Beyond the degree, you know how much God loves you. And he's crazy about you. So we got a bunch of people running around that don't know that they're loved. Let me tell you, the key to change the America is this. Respect for persons. Everybody respecting one another. You don't have to like each other. 
respect one another as being made in the image of God. That's a challenge, isn't it? So made in the image of God. The scripture says in Ephesians 2.10, we're his masterpiece. Uh, he didn't make anything any greater, any finer than you and me. Number two, Jesus loves you. He loves you. There's no way you can do anything to make him love you any more than he loves you right now. You say, well, I don't believe in Jesus. He still loves you. You can't get away from that. You can't discard that. Turn your back on him. Walk away. Deny him. Deny that he loves you. He still loves you. You can't change that fact. It'd be nice if you just give up and enjoy his love. And so a little uh, group of kids were asked by a teacher one day in a class, a uh, Sunday class in a church, said, do you believe God loves you? Everybody raised their hand. Do you believe, secondly, when you do something bad that God still loves you? Nobody's hands went up. When you are at your worst, he loves you the best. He doesn't love the worst, but he loves you because you're made in his image. What else did Jesus do for you? And what does he think about you? Well, he thinks so highly of you and me that he died on a cross for you and me. He thinks so highly of you and me that he has gifted you and me. He thinks so highly of you and me that he has a plan for your life. If you go again to Ephesians chapter number 2, verse number 10, it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. He's got a purpose. He's got a meaning for your life. I love the story about the little um, girl uh, who went in a room one night. Her mama put her in a room, and there was a big storm outside, lightning and thunder and rain. And her mom went back in a few minutes later to check on her, and she's standing up at the windowsill with her little nose pressed up against the window. I mean, the lightning's flashing. It's the thunder and the rain. Her mom says, sweetheart, get down, get down. I don't want you to get hurt. Little girl said, Mama, Mama, it's okay. God's trying to take my picture. That's what God thinks about you. He loves you that much. Let me tell you, one of my friends said, you know, when I get to heaven, I think God's going to have a wallet. And in his wallet, he's going to have my picture. You know what? I wouldn't doubt that one bit. God cares for you and loves you so much. Listen to this. We are all a mess ready to be made into a masterpiece. We're all a mess, but he loves messes and to make them into a masterpiece. Jesus also gives you hope. Hope, we need hope. We need hope in our day and time right now. Hope that the past is forgiven, number one, and he's taking care of that if you come to know him. Hope for the present as we live by the word of God, the Bible, and the power that he gives in us through the person of the Holy Spirit a hope that we can change, a hope that we can get through the pain, a hope when we have painful losses in our lives. Listen to this. Crisis doesn't make or break you. It reveals your character. Let me say that again. Crisis doesn't make or break you. It reveals your character. I tell you right now in 2020, I keep saying, where are the Christians? Where are the Christians? Where, where are the Christians with Jesus and all this character? What are they doing? Uh, how are they standing up for him? Where are the Christians? And next week, my title is going to be, if you're brave enough to watch it, Are Christians Destroying America? And we'll talk about it next week. And so there's also hope for the future. Hope for the future. I love uh, some of the quotes that I was able to find. Listen to these on hope. Hope is our belief in the future based on Christ who holds it. Hope is not about the seen, but about the unseen, about him. A man can stand almost anything as long as there is hope. In Christ, hope is always outlasting anything else. On the other side of hopelessness is Jesus. Hope, hope, hope. Listen to this. Because Jesus lived, died, and rose from the dead, we have hope. It's never too late to see dead marriages come alive. Are you the husband you need to be? And if wives are watching this, are you the wife you need to be? Do you have dead relationships with those around you? He can bring those alive and resurrect them. Uh, do you have a dead life? 
Do you feel bored and just going through the motions? You're drifting. It's never too late. Listen, Jesus can give you not only eternal life forever, but he can now give you a quality of life now in your marriage, in your relationship, with your kids, in your life. Well, that's not all. Jesus also can meet your need for love. So um, do you love your wife, if you're married, more than you did the day you married her? And again, ladies, if you're watching this, do you love your husband more than the day that you married him? Ooh, that can get a little uh, nervous. Uh, do you love people that bug you? Isn't it interesting that Jesus said, don't only love those who love you, but love your enemies? Jesus loves us. Listen, as a result, we can love others, even people that we could think we could never love. Because Jesus' love, once he lives in us, will flow through us in the lie, into the lives of other people. Greatest definition I've ever heard in my life of love is this. Love is constructive behavior. Write that down. This is revolutionary. Love is constructive behavior. You say, what does that mean? It means doing what's best for the other person regardless of how you feel towards that person at any given moment. What would, that, what would that do in your marriage if that's the way you operated? What would that do in the riots today if people were doing for others? I mean, back and forth, whatever the, the population might be and the background might be, doing what's best for the other person regardless of how they feel towards the person. Because I can tell you right now, that's not happening. We're not doing the best for other people, regardless of how we feel towards them, and only Jesus Christ in us can give us the ability to do that. Listen to this. If you draw a triangle, this is another triangle illustration, and at the top, you put a question mark. <clears throat> Here's what Plato said. <clears throat> he said, uh, we arrange uh, all the things in life that we think to be significant and important uh, at the bottom on the base of that triangle. As the base of the triangle is moved toward the apex, the base will get smaller and smaller, leaving room for fewer and fewer things. We will drop those things which are least important to us. We will hold on to those things which we deem to be the most important. Finally, when the apex of the triangle is reached, there is room only for one thing. So his question was this, what is the one thing that you will hold on to when you've sacrificed everything else. For a Christian, that is Jesus. My question to you is, what are you holding on to? Or maybe I should even ask, what has a hold on you? If Jesus Christ is number one in your life, you will love in a new way because Jesus will love through you. Finally, Jesus meets our need for purpose. The greatest purpose that God has for us is this, that our chief goal, our chief purpose, our chief end is to glorify God in everything we do and enjoy him forever. Glorify him and enjoy him. Let me ask you something. Have you ever seen a dog with ulcers? Listen, uh, my friend said this, the reason a dog doesn't get ulcers is a dog doesn't try to do anything but be a dog. Trees rarely cry because a tree never tries to be anything but a tree, apart from a few specially designed trees. Fish never try to fly. Birds don't try to swim. All of creation glorifies God by being that for which it was created. The exception is mankind. Mm. So you glorify God. How do you do that? By loving him. And you know you love him, he says, by doing what he says to do in this book. The scripture says we know how much we love him by not only knowing the information, but by doing what he says. So what, what does he want us to do? Let me just give you one angle on this as we close up. The things that break God's heart ought to break your heart and break my heart. Not only should it break our hearts, emotionally, we ought to do something about it when we can. So 
when Jesus comes into your life, that's just step one. All succeeding steps are to grow and develop and allow him to work through us to carry out his purposes on this planet. So you say, so what are some of the things that break his heart? Let me give you a few. People who don't know him. People that, uh, that know him, followers who know him but never grow up. They're still in spiritual diapers. Uh, people who uh, say they love him, but they won't open their mouth to share the good news of Jesus Christ with all those around them. Tell you what else breaks his heart. Divorce, turmoil in the family, hunger, physically, emotionally, socially, the brokenhearted, the distress. This is what it says in 1 John 3, 17 and 18. If anyone has material possession and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. So often what we give people is a non-negotiable God bless you. Well, God bless you. That doesn't do a whole lot to help somebody. So purpose, purpose, purpose. Most people on this planet don't have a, a deep abiding purpose. This is what Bernard Shaw, George Bernard Shaw wrote. Oh, this is a good one. This is the true joy of life, the being used up for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one, being a force of nature instead of a feverish, selfish little clot of ailments and grievances, complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. Wow. God never promises smooth sailing. He never promises always for us to always be happy. So, someone said this, Jesus changed the course of history, and now he wants to change the course of your life. Are you allowing him to do that, or is it just going to be the same old, same old, same old? And then, one of my favorite writers said this, I must surrender my fascination with myself to a more worthy preoccupation with the character and purposes of God. I am not the point. He is. I exist for him. He does not exist for me. Dear friends, <clears throat> it's all about Jesus. Do you know him? Is he in your life? If he is, then are you living like him? Are you allowing him to meet the needs that he wants to meet so you can be a vibrant individual for Christ? Living the adventure, living the thrill of following him, but also knowing it can be tough sometimes, very tough and painful, but making a difference as, as the salt and light in this crazy world that so desperately needs Jesus Christ. Well, Father, thank you for our time today and for letting us know how much you love us and how much you care, that you want to meet our needs for, for forgiveness you want to meet our needs for significance, for love, for purpose, all the rest of it and more. And so, Father, I pray today will be a new day for many of us, that you will give us that deep and abiding and lasting hope that can only come in a relationship with you. And then, Lord, as we begin to develop and grow in that, that our lives would be open to allow you to flow in us and through us into a hurting world and people that so desperately need you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You think about that.